Bill, what does it mean to say God created everything, the world, from nothing? I think we can understand this concept more easily if we recall Aristotle's distinction between different types of causes. Aristotle said one type of cause is what he called an efficient cause. An efficient cause is a cause that produces its be, uh, the effect in being. It produces the effect in existence. An example of this would be Michelangelo being the efficient cause of the statue called the David. Uh, he is the one who produced, who sculpted, who made the David. In addition to efficient causes, Aristotle said there's also material causes, and this would be the stuff out of which the effect is made. So in this case, the material cause of the David would be the block of marble, which was brought from the quarry to Michelangelo to sculpt. So that when you ask about the cause of the David, you would say that Michelangelo is its efficient cause, but the marble block is the material cause. Now, with that distinction in mind, the doctrine of creation is the view that God is the efficient cause. Made it happen. Exactly. Of all reality exterior to himself, and that there is no material cause of that reality. There was no pre-existing stuff. Exactly. In other words, it's a rejection of any kind of metaphysical dualism that Originally, there was God and some kind of other stuff which God over fashioned. against God, yes, which he fashioned or shaped into a world. Rather, God is the efficient cause of the world and everything in it, all matter and energy, space and time themselves, have been brought into being by God at a certain point uh, in time. So the doctrine of creation, again, would be the doctrine that God has brought everything other than himself into being without any material cause. So let's layer on this the latest thinking in cosmology, which brings everything back to a point in time, a small fraction of a second, 10 to the minus 40-something, who knows how small, incredibly small time period, incredibly small space in which there is violent energy extremely hot, energetic, from which everything later develops. Yes. Where do we get that from? (laughs) Well, on the Christian view, that initial uh, singularity or initial space-time boundary is brought into being by God. And I think one of the most exciting... Out of nothing. Out of nothing, yes, without any material cause. And he is the cause of all the energy and mass in the universe and of space and time themselves, the framework in which matter and energy exist. And one of the most exciting developments of contemporary cosmology is that it has brought this doctrine of creation out of nothing into mainstream science and and mainstream thinking. For centuries, the Judeo-Christian tradition held to the doctrine of creation out of nothing in the face of ancient Greek philosophy, modern Enlightenment naturalism, and modern materialism and idealism, all of which said that the universe is eternal and uncreated. And in the face of almost universal opposition, the Judeo-Christian tradition has held to the fact of creation out of nothing. And then dramatically, during the course of the 20th century, against all expectation, this prediction was verified by modern science, which has established rigorously that there is a past boundary to the universe before which literally nothing existed. Now, there are two different views on that, other than what you're saying. From the theological point of view, there are some theologians who would say, even today, that there is no deep theological stake in the difference between a creation from nothing or God sort of sustaining eternally this eternal world. So let's deal with that first. You're entirely correct about that, and I think that this represents, to be quite frank, a retreat on the part of certain theologians in the face of this sort of opposition from naturalism, materialism, and idealism that I spoke of a moment ago. I think that it is an attempt to shelter 
theology in a safe harbor of non-falsifiable, non-verifiable So no matter what domains. happens, it can't be attacked. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's an attempt on the part of theologians to shelter theology in a safe harbor of non-verifiable, non-falsifiable assertions, which really renders theology utterly irrelevant to the world. And so I think it's quite a mistaken strategy to try to shelter theology in that way. And frankly, it doesn't need sheltering because, as I say, I think that the best evidence of contemporary cosmology is strongly confirmatory of the doctrine of creation. Now, from the cosmologist's point of view, many would take the same data and not come to your conclusion. They would say that there is some inherent thing in the universe, some laws that caused uh, that there's either an unending series of, of causes or that that first singularity kind of uh, was um, uh, rolled into existence by itself in some way, or some cosmic foam emerged, and it, each singularity is the product of this cosmic foam uh, coming into existence, and suddenly one of them in an asymmetry uh, explodes into a Big Bang, and this has been going on forever and ever. So each Big Bang that we see may look like it has a singularity, but in fact this has been going on forever and ever. We don't need any God. Well, certainly those attempts have been made, but in one sense, the history of 20th century cosmology has been the history of one failed attempt after another to avert the absolute beginning predicted in the standard Big Bang model. We've seen the steady state model. We've seen oscillating models of the universe. We've seen vacuum fluctuation models, uh, chaotic inflationary models, quantum gravity models, most recently uh, the so-called ekpyrotic cyclical models of the universe, all of these attempting to avoid the absolute beginning predicted in the standard model. And one after another, these theories have either been falsified by the data or shown to be mathematically inconsistent, or else they have been shown to imply the very beginning of the universe that they sought to avoid. So I think that the prevailing view among contemporary cosmologists is that the universe cannot be eternal in the past, but that there is a past space-time boundary that represents the absolute beginning of the cosmos. I, I think that some of those arguments would say, though, that that you you can't determine that, that this recent experience of a Big Bang is... is uh, uh, once you go beyond that, either uh, a membrane, uh, different dimensions, or some of these different theories could have oscillations before the Big Bang that, that we'd have never have access to. And maybe that's non-falsifiable, but I, I don't think those are eliminated. Well, you're alluding, I think, there to Paul Steinhardt and Neil Turok's so-called brain cosmology, which is an attempt to exploit string theory to develop uh, an eternally oscillating universe in higher dimensions. And they tried to extend this infinitely into the past. But what was discovered in 2003, in the fall of that year, by uh, three cosmologists, Alexander Vilenkin, Arvind Bord, and Alan Guth, the father of inflationary cosmology, uh, through their theorem, they were able to demonstrate that even these models cannot be extended infinitely into the past but that there has to be a past boundary uh, at some point that represents the beginning of the universe. So even these brain cosmologies and higher dimensional cosmologies, which are really very metaphysical in character, have been shown to be non-infinitely extendable into the past. That is to say that they must have a past boundary. So while the case is by no means open and shut, I mean, so the very nature of science is that its results are always provisional. They're always tentative. I think we can say with great confidence that the person who believes in the creation of the universe out of nothing stands solidly within mainstream science today. Minimally, we can say that. And that's quite different from the previous uh, 2,000 years of, of speculation about the origin of the, the universe. 